Okay, um, we, I'm here. We're going to talk about the invent. Okay, <laughs> going to talk about the invention of the white race. Theodore W. Allen's magnum opus, what he worked his most of his uh, adult life on. Um, but I use Hubert Harrison as an introduction because certain key aspects about Harrison's life, I think, are very instructive and a good entree into the work that Allen does. I hope everybody can see. Try and get comfortable because we're going to be doing a lot of slides. All right, Harrison lives from 1883 to 1927, if you're not familiar with him. Brilliant intellectual, race and class conscious, radical internationalist, considered the father of Harlem radicalism by A. Philip Randolph and others in the period when Harlem is the international, quote, international Negro Mecca and the center of radical black thought. He is, I argue in my books, and no one has seriously challenged it, the key ideological link, uh, uh, key link in the ideological unity of the Black Liberation Movement, and why? Because he's the major radical influence on A. Philip Randolph, the class radicals, major radical influence on Marcus Garvey, the race radicals. Take those lines of descent down to when I grow up, we got Martin and Malcolm, right? So he's a very key figure. People should, I think people want to learn more about him. Sean, we ready? Okay, Harrison, and these are some of the things about Harrison which I think are going to be instructive for understanding Allen. Harrison arrives from St. Croix. He's born in St. Croix in 1883, arrives in New York in 1900. He encountered a vicious white supremacy un unlike anything he knew in St. Croix. Harrison, Marcus Garvey, Claude McKay, all that early generation Caribbean activists who came here commented on what they encountered here, how vicious it was, and to this day, people coming from elsewhere in the world are still shocked at how vicious the white supremacy is in the U.S. They often commented on the difference. Harrison used the word shocked in one of the first pieces he wrote publicly. Sean, next one. Claude McKay, I think, summarized it well. And Claude McKay is a very good friend of Harrison. And he writes, when he came to the U.S., it was the first time I'd ever come face to face with such manifest, implacable hatred of my race. My feelings were indescribable. I had heard of prejudice in America, but never dreamed of it being so intensely bitter, right? It's qualitatively different, and that's going to be a point that uh, Alan elaborates on. What, the difference, I use St. Croix because I'm, very, I'm mostly familiar with Harrison's roots, right? But it's very similar, what I'm going to describe, Jamaica, Barbados, the Anglo-Caribbean. Um, in St. Croix, there was no history of lynch terror, no formal segregation. Class promotion of people of African descent was fostered to a certain degree, and white supremacy was not as virulent or as organized as in the U.S. Next slide. In St. Croix, and here's part of the explanation, the key part. St. Croix, you got 5% of the population is European, 15% is so-called colored, 80% of the population was black, basically plantation labor in St. Croix. The, hold on one second. Right? The 5% the 5% couldn't control the 95%, so they tried to utilize the 15%. It worked for a while, but when push came to shove in a big struggle down there, free colored side with the black plantation laborers, there's emancipation, a few other struggles. I get into that in the Harrison talks, in the Harrison books. In St. Croix, the greatly outnumbered European, for social control reasons, implemented a policy of promotion of a sector of the African descended population. Next slide. So, in St. Croix, where Harrison comes from, because he's commenting on the difference, there's promotion and land holding. Harrison's born on a plantation on an estate that's owned by two men of color. You wouldn't find that for the most part in Virginia, the southern U.S. Free coloreds served in the militia. That's the principal instrument of social control on the island. Same in Jamaica and Barbados. In 1834, free coloreds in St. Croix, an edict of full equality. A law is passed, at least nominally, granting full equality between free coloreds and whites. In contrast, the U.S. in that period, the policy was one of severe racial prescription for African Americans. You accumulate and you get the knock on the door at midnight, right? You, 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 there's no rising, there's no social mobility in general, right? Um, slave patrols in the U.S. were lily white in contrast to with the free color, right? And that by definition, no African Americans serving in the slave patrol, um, they're not allowed, right? And finally, as opposed to the policy of um, edict of full equality, we know in the U.S. The, the law of the land was the Dred Scott decision. No black person had any right that a white's bound to respect. Harrison was the leading black activist in the Socialist Party for a while before he founds the New Negro Movement and does many other things. 
While in the Socialist Party, he wrote some of the first major series on what was called at the time the Negro and Socialism. So it's the first black kind of activist Marxist writing on this. Major series in the New York Call and then in the International Socialist Review. He writes in 1911, a little over 100 years ago, <laughs> politically, the Negro is the touchstone of the modern democratic idea. The presence of our Negro puts our democracy to the test and reveals the falsity of it. A touchstone is a black stone. You rub it against gold to test the purity of gold. This is an extraordinary metaphor. Any issue we look at in society, housing, education, health care, pick it. Let's put it to the test. How are black people faring and what are we going to do about it? It's a guide. It's a, it's, it, get your antennas up. It's a focus. right? He goes on in that same passage, true democracy and equality for, for the Negro. And the phrase Negro he used, I'll get into that in a second, with pride. Uh, he led in the use of that phrase, as a matter of fact, um, implies a revolution startling to even think of. And what this here foreshadows, I believe, is the civil rights black liberation movement of the 1960s, which served as a catalyst not for all the movements, the anti-war movement, the student movement, the women's movement, and so on and so forth. And they all those movements recognize it, right? Uh, that hero those heroic struggles. And why? Be because the cause was just, but also because it was hitting at how social control is maintained in this country. It was a, a challenge, right? Um, regarding the use of the word Negro, what I want to just mention, Harrison fought in 1911 and 1912 to use Negro with a capital N in the Socialist Party and prevailed. By 1913-14, they were doing it in opposition to uh, Negro with a lowercase n, um, uh, racial epithets, and um, colored the phrases that were used. So it was a, a self-assertion, a mark of pride. In the 60s, there was a new generation that reassessed, and now they pushed for black, African-American, Afro-American, African, et cetera, right? But, I, and of course, Harrison then founds the militant New Negro movement. His paper is the voice of the Negro. He edits Marcus Garvey's paper, The Negro World. This was very self-assertive in that period, right, with the capital N, uh, just going on. Uh, and all of this is going to, we're going to see this, how it bears on Harris Allen's work later. Next, Sean. In the same period, 1912, Harrison writes, 10 million Negroes of America form a group that is more essentially proletarian than any other American group, and the Negro under, uh, under slavery, the most thoroughly exploited of the American proletariat. This understanding of black labor as proletarian is central to a whole new reinterpretation of United States history. We see it in Harrison in 1912, Sean. We see it in Du Bois in 1935, when he writes Black Reconstruction, which redoes our entire interpretation of that. And we'll see it more for those who take the class in Allen in his last work toward, towards a revolution in labor history, which starts from the premise that slavery was capitalism, slave owners were capitalists, and black laborers were proletarians. And it does so many things in reinterpreting our history. First, we learn the most heroic examples in, in labor history. Two, we pull the covers off white supremacist betrayals of black labor. And three, what Alan argues is we're able to really get at the roots and origin of this white race with that understanding going on. Harrison leaves the Socialist Party in 1914 over white supremacy. It's unfortunate that we didn't know much more about him for the last 60 or 70 years, because when he leaves, he utters one of the most profound but least heated criticisms in the history of the left in this country. He writes, the Socialist Party, like the labor movement, has insisted on white race first and class after. It put the white race first before class. Very profound criticism. It's too bad we weren't pondering that much more seriously for the last 80, 90 years. And it leads us right to Allen and his work on what is this white race thing, right? So this is Allen. This is around the time he's finishing the invention of the white race, I would say. In his, he's, in, he's finishing it in his 70s. Sean? We're going quickly now, right? Allen lives from 1919 to 2005. He's a working class intellectual activist, a former coal miner, factory worker, teacher, postal worker, librarian. 
He originates the white skin concept in 1965. Forget all this stuff that you've been being told about knapsacks and 1986 and 87 and all. He, he originates the concept in 65. It's so influential that the New York Times is writing in 1969 how SDS is waging a national campaign against white skin privilege. And, uh, and, and Allen's analysis of white skin privileges that we're going to see is far different from what comes along later. And it's got to do with class and the understanding of the white race. Um, he originates the invention of the white race analysis in 1974-75 in this pamphlet which again is available online, I'll show you where in a second. And uh, then over the next 20 years develops it into his two volume work, Invention of the White Race. Volume one, and Allen is very careful with his terminology and his words, so they're not thrown out loosely. Volume one, Racial Oppression and Social Control. Volume two, The Origin, and I'm gonna explain why he uses origin of racial oppression in Anglo-America. Um, here, if you have paper and pencil, but if you go to my webpage, you'll get all this. The webpage is simply www.jeffreybperry.net, my name. I think on the Brecht Forum page you can link to it. Much of what we're going to discuss about the development of his thought, but in much greater detail, is in this article that I did a while ago. It started out as 2,500 words for a publication called Daedalus and wound up to be 117 pages. Very serious analysis, Harris and Allen. Available for free. Allen also, we're talking about the invention of the white race, after he finished, he finished volume one originally in 1994, volume two in 1997, 1998, he does a summary of the two volumes in two parts. They're each 50 pages long. They're available online at, from Cultural Logic, which is an publica online publication. You can get them off my webpage. Again, everything free as we can make it. This pamphlet, uh, we did a new edition, 2006. We have it here, $3 if you want to. Hard copy, free online. Um, amongst his other writings, I just want to call your attention to, and these again are all available on, online, free. White Blind Spot, 1967, that's the real pioneer publication, and that was combined with this, pamp, uh, this article, Can White Workers Crossed Out Radicals Be Radicalized in 1969? That's the article which so influenced SDS and much of the new communist movement in the next few years. Uh, white Supremacy in U.S. History, again influencing the new communist movement. Critical review of Edmund Morgan, I'm going to get into who Morgan is and why this is important. In defense of affirmative action and, uh, and employment policy. Race, ethnicity, history in the 2000 census about Latinos in the Hispanic category, you'll find it very interesting. And a critical review of David Rodiger's Wages of Whiteness, I really recommend people look at it. Next. Okay. Allen wrote on the back of volume one of the invention of the white race, the first edition, when the first Africans arrived in Virginia in 1619, there were no white people there, nor would there be, according to the colonial records, for another 60 years. And he had gone through 885 county years of records over 20 years, and I've got those records home. He would go to the county courthouses, and no one, no one has done this with such rigor. This is what I call proletarian scholarship. This is the real, real stuff, right? And he would go there, and he would transcribe, and then he would come back, and he would type it up. And, and that's the basis for so, some of the in, in, in extraordinary <coughs> documentation. These two volumes of Allen, each volume is about 35, 40% notes, right, and, and, and uh, appendices. So it's very, and it's small font. I mean, it, it's very uh, heavily documented based on primary sources. Not yet, Sean, come back. Um, so he goes through 885 county years of Virginia's colonial records. Uh, and that means you go to York County, and each year, you know, that's one county year of records. Go on. All right. There were no, as he explains, as he subsequently explains, others living in the colony at the time were English. They had been English when they left, and naturally they and their Virginia-born children were English. They were not white. White identity had to be carefully taught, and it would be another 60 years before the word would appear. And he's not simply talking about semantics. As we're going to see, the white race as we know it was not existing and not functioning. 
1640, still no white people. John Punch, about four or five months ago, you might have seen Ancestry.com did a piece that got picked up on the media about Barack Obama's ancestor on, on his mother's side. They did a whole big thing. Barack Obama had an ancestor who had been se uh, had an, uh, a sentence of lifetime bond servitude imposed upon him. That fellow's name was John Punch. But the interesting thing that they were playing up you know, in the papers was this was on his mother's side, not his father's side. But here's the only document that exists about John Punch. And John Punch, um, what's interesting is he runs away with two other servants, bond servants, right? One is Victor, a Dutchman, and the other a Scotchman named James Gregory. They're still not white, right? Next slide, Sean. The big battle is there were no white people there. Bacon's Rebellion, 1670. This is the big battle that Alan focuses on, uh, and we're going to talk about in some depth. But here's the account of the fellow who was, took the lead in putting down the rebellion, na named Thomas Grantham. He's a ship merchant. I there met 400 English and Negroes in arms um, who were much dissatisfied, betrayed them. Some were for shooting me, others for cutting me in pieces. In the final stages, 80 Negroes and 20 English. Don't leave yet, Sean. One thing, just anecdotally, since I talked before about Harrison's struggle to do Negro with a capital N, right? That was because it was now, and when Harrison comes here, it's all being spelled with a small n. But back in the 17th century, before the invention of the white race, this is the original document. Negro is with a capital N. Go on. All right, here's the main theses of Allen's work. If you don't leave here with anything else, try to just hear this, right? Three prongs. The white race was invented as a ruling class social control formation in response to labor solidarity as manifested in the latter Civil War stages of Bacon's Rebellion, but not only in that struggle, there was a whole period of solidarity you know, and struggle going on, which I'll talk about. Two, a system of racial privileges was deliberately instituted by the late 17th, early 18th century Anglo-American bourgeoisie in order to define and establish the white race and establish a system of racial oppression. Deliberately instituted, very important, we'll talk about why. Three, the consequence was not only ruinous to the interest of the African Americans, all African Americans, not only those who were enslaved, but all, Af but it was also disastrous for European uh, American <coughs> workers. That last thing about not in the interest of the European American workers is where some people who have talked about this white privilege going all the way back, even you know, the Weatherman and stuff like that, don't, don't get Allen, right? Because Allen's arguing, of course, they get him and they reject him, but that's not what Allen's saying. At all. Uh, this is what Allen's saying. And by that, he means their own position, the laboring class people, vis-a-vis -vis the rich and powerful, was not improved but was weakened by the white skin privilege system. And we're going to try and document why. So what he's arguing is the white race was a political invention. It is no part of genetic evolution. Next slide. He says more about the white race. He says it must be understood not simply as a social construct, but as a ruling class social control formation. Why does he emphasize ruling class? Because if you just say it's a social construct and you're not clear on who's driving that ship, then you fall back on all the ra racist arguments, the cultural, it's innate, right? Why, how else do you explain it? Why would, we, why would we construct such a thing unless it was innate, unless you can focus on who, who, the origin and who's driving it? He says more about the white race, and this is what first attracted me to Alan's work some 40, many years ago, when he spoke at the precursor to the Brecht Forum right here on 14th Street, a place called Alternate U way back, which is the grandmother of this place. And uh, I was in the crowd like you folks, and, you know, and I heard him for the first time. But he argues that the white race has served as the principal historic guarantor of ruling class domination of national life in the United States. We in this room particularly, if that's true, we've got to deal with that, right? Next slide. He says more. He explains that the white race is an all-class formation, right? You got the ruling elite, you got the middle elements, and you got the work, the white race, right? Um, he says what is key holding it together is the racial privileges conferred on laboring class European Americans. That's the key, right? Because, well, we'll get into it, it's not in their interest, but 
That's what holds that thing together. And here, and I did 33 years in the labor movement, so this next phrase was very important to me, this next understanding. If it's an all-class formation that serves the ruling class, Allen argues it is the basic, most prevalent, and historic form of class collaborationism in the US. Right? That's it, in a nutshell. That's the key. All right. Um, he also argues it's the quintessential peculiar institution. For those familiar with a lot of US history, you know in the period of slavery, the, particularly the slaveholding elite would, you know, with their code words, talk about our peculiar institution with all the arrogance, you know, that, that comes from that. And just like they didn't want to name it in the Constitution, right? You know, they, our peculiar institution, and then they give a wink, right? Well, Allen stands all that on his head, and he says, in the United States, the truly peculiar institution is this white race, right? And only by understanding what is peculiar about the peculiar institution can one know what is exceptional about American exceptionalism. Now, this phrase, American exceptionalism, people familiar with left history, there's a whole history of discussion in uh, communist socialist literature about, um, quote, American exceptionalism. And why is it that the US seems to be exempt from the normal course of class struggle that develops in other advanced capitalist countries? Why are we so backwards, right? You know, there's a big discussion on it, which I'll show in a second. And let's go, Sean, we'll flip. So that, that's some of the background on um, just overview of Allen and the white race. Now, here's when he starts out to write the book. He starts out to write the book in the 1960s. He's already been active for 40 years, right? Not 40 years. He's in his 40s, but been active for many years in his adult life. Um, history of my book. He starts out, I have a, he has a fascination with history. He's got an identification with the ordinary people. He lived his last 50 years, Brooklyn Avenue and Dean Street in Brooklyn. He's a regular person, just like Harrison, 231 West 134th Street, the most densely populated block in Harlem. These are working class, intellectuals of the people, right? Um, uh, he, my moral conviction uh, that racial discrimination is a bad thing. So he starts with just some basic good foundations, right? The human foundations. He's influenced by the changed ambiance of the American civil rights struggle, which I said how it influenced, I commented earlier from Harrison, how it influenced so much and so many people in so many ways. And Allen was certainly one. And, um, and it led him to ponder, could it be possible that the key to defeat suffered by democratic, progressive, <laughs> populist, and socialist movements in this country uh, was related to this in some way, and maybe the answer to this question of American exceptionalism. He was influenced by Du Bois's Black Reconstruction, which I cited earlier. He didn't know about Harrison in this early period, because Harrison was outside much of the, this discourse. And around 1965, he sets out to write a history and he's going to look at the three major crises in US history, which is very important for us today because we're moving deeply into this next crisis. And we've got to learn the lessons of what happened in the last three major crises. And those three crises are of the 1870s, 1890s, and the populist period, 1930s depression. He also sought to address, on the theoretical level, because he's a lefty, like, again, like many people here, why no socialism in the US? And why was there that generally low level of class consciousness in this country compared to, compared to so many other places? He reviewed the literature that was out there by the leading left labor and nor regular general historians, right? Engels, Engels Marx's co-workers, Sorg, who translates capital into English, right? Uh, Hilquit, leader in the Socialist Party, Foster, leader in the Communist Party, the Beards, Frederick Jackson Turner, and so on and so on. And he sums up their work, and this is all documented, chapter and verse, with, that they put forth a basic six-pronged rationale explaining the low level of class consciousness in the United States. And in a nutshell, here's what the six prongs are. Early right to vote and other constitutional liberties, heterogeneity of the working class, free land, safety valve, higher wages, social mobility, the early development of an aristocracy of labor. Allen's critique. Each of the six prongs is more myth than reality. And again, go into, I, I, the writings are available, so you can read all his documentation, again, from primary sources. 
But it's, each of the six prongs is more myth than reality. Free land, what free land? It was going to the railroads, it was going, you know, not, normal people aren't getting this, working people aren't getting this. And they all have to be examined, re-examined in light of white supremacy. And he points out that each of these six factors are white skin privileges and whatever their effect upon the thinking of white workers may be said to be, the same could not be claimed in the case of black workers. Next. So, Allen countered with his own theory, and this is still back in the 60s. White supremacy reinforced amongst Europeans by white skin privilege was the main retardant of working class consciousness in the US. Efforts at radical social change to direct principal efforts at challenging the system of white supremacy and white skin privilege. If this is the main retardant, this is what we've got to deal with. Next. Here, this is very important, I think. This is the one that attracted me to him when I, when I first heard him. I said, wow, this is deep, right? He reviewed the three periods of national crisis that I mentioned, and he argues and documents how he thinks and how I think he shows the key to defeat of the forces of democracy, labor, and socialism was in each period achieved by ruling class appeals to white supremacism basically by fostering white skin privileges of laboring class European Americans. Next. Here's the Great Depression, the most recent one. Here's an example. Great Depression, what happens? There's all that struggle we know about, but Ira Katznelson teaches history up at Columbia University. He's written a book when affirmative action was white. Describes how each and every federal program from the 1930s into the 1960s was shaped in a white supremacist fashion. We look at the major labor legislation, again, that's the background I'm coming out of, the Fair Labor Standards Act, the National Labor Relations Act, Social Security until 1951, they exclude agricultural and domestic workers. 60% of the black and Latino, actually, black and Latino workforce, 70% in uh, down south, right? Um, the GI Bill, the GI Bill you can get a home with zero down payment and a low interest loan, right? This is where we live, New York area. Statistics for those GI homeowner loans out of 67,000 that are awarded, less than 100 go to families of color. That's how you get the white suburbs around New York and every other city in this country. Federal government policy, right? Ruling class policy. Here's the other big one, and this one I can't emphasize enough. I really can't emphasize this one enough. This whole jobs thing, right? And pe people say, oh, we need an FDR-type jobs program. Not quite. When the depression starts in 1929, the black to white unemployment ratio was one to one which if you think about it makes sense because black people are brought here to labor, right? So they, they, you, it's not surprising that they're laboring, right? By 1947, after all those programs of the New Deal the ratio, and the war employment, right? The ratio is two to one, which is all anyone in this room has ever known. Two to one or some variant of two to one, right? Government policy. Next. No, this one's very important. Allen summarizes, and I think this is instructive because we're going to come back to this. He says, so if we step back a little and we look at the history of struggle in this country and you know, how this capitalism is working here, he says, in the normal course of capitalist event, events, there's a deterioration in the condition of working people. We all kind of know that. He says, at a certain point, as things get worse, it even starts to erode the privileges of the, European, of the white workers. He says, then we start seeing some overtures of unity. Come, my brother and sister, let's get together. We've got to fight. And, and this, is, this is what we see in Madison. This is the early stages. In Occupy, you know, people are starting to talk about class now, right? He says what has traditionally happened in stage four is the bourgeoisie moves to resubstantiate the white skin privileges. And then what has happened is the white workers take what he calls the poison bait. It's like a shot of heroin. It's no good. It's not good for you. They, and they, they you know, submit to the old order again. That's what he, he lays that out as a, you know, a nice framework to think about and consider. And uh, I would argue we're in the beginning stages of stage three myself, and we'll come back to that. Go on, Sean. So getting back to Alan and the history of his book, as we, where we left it off, he was going to look at those three crises. I went off a little on that. 
So he's ready to start writing that book on the history of the three crises to sum up these lessons, which I've just elaborated. And then a book comes out by a guy named Winthrop D. Jordan. It wins the National Book Award in the late 60s. It's called White Over Black, American Attitude Towards the Negroes, 1550 to 1812. You see by the title, he equates white with American, right? And it is the response to the, the intellectual, the academic response to the civil rights black liberation struggle. This is gonna be the counter. And what the core of Jordan's argument is, is racism is innate. That's the core, it's an unthinking decision because if racism is innate, why fight it? You know, you, you can't change it, that's the way it is. No, but this is, he, in the academy, and I'll, I'll show you leading left writers who praise Jordan to this day, right? All right, um, so, um, that's it. so Alan says, well, I gotta deal with this, you know, somebody's gotta take this on, and that leads him back to the 17th century and how it all gets started. Next, Sean. So he, he, Alan now is trying to address the following questions. What is the counter to Jordan's argument? How do we explain 100 years after emancipation that white supremacy and white supremacism are still so strong in this country? Why wasn't there more struggle against white supremacism by European Americans? And what are the ideological arguments that undermine struggle against white supremacy? Sean? So he concludes that race privilege system, and I think this is important, going, just going back to my own intellectual development stuff, because what he reasoned that the bourgeoisie could not long have sustained this ideological influence over the proletarians by mere racist ideology. The idea alone is not gonna do it, right? It's gotta have some kind of material base. And he, he says it has to be given a material base in the form of deliberately contrived systems of race privileges. <laughs> He maintains, and he's been maintaining consistently, and we will probe this much more deeply, that the ideology of white racism is inappropriate to these European American workers because it's contrary to their class interests, right? But he explained that, it, or he reasons, if race privileges are in the interests of the white workers, then the white workers should be better off where, where the privileges are most marked. And where are they most marked? In the South. But in fact, that's where the white workers fare worse, right? In terms of all the economic statistics and everything like that. Go on, Sean. But what Alan goes and what really, again, struck me and impressed me and kind of shaped a lot of how I understood these things, he goes after what I, he would argue, I would argue, are the two main ideological props of white supremacy amongst European American workers. The two main arguments that even if people are getting ready to wage the good fight, you know, kind of help beat it back, help beat that effort back, help sap it, right? The idea that racism is innate, that's Winthrop Jordan's argument. But the second one is the idea that white workers benefit from white race privileges. If they benefit, why should they oppose it, right? And he argues instead, as I indicated before, that we have to understand these privileges as a poison bait, like a shot of heroin. Go on. The unthinking decision is Winthrop Jordan's, right? Sean, next one. The too few free poor to matter. Edmund, Edmund Sears Morgan is um, a professor emeritus at Yale. He was president of the Organization of American Historians, a leading American historian cited in publications recently in praise, right? Um, and or Morgan writes a, a book that got a lot of recognition for the writing on the colonial period, had, some much, had m many good aspects to it, but his core argument was that there were too, free, too few free poor Europeans and Americans in Virginia to matter. That's the case in St. Croix. That's not the case in Virginia, and we'll get into the statistics. That's not the case in the US, and I'm gonna explain why, but it's got to do with all those European American laborers that are here. Um, Go on, Sean. Morgan goes further, and I'm just going to mention this quickly for those who follow these historical arguments, because he puts forth something that you'll hear in the academy a lot. And he talks about the American paradox. The American paradox. And um, Allen says that whole argument is an assessment of white supremacism in a positive light. The essence of Morgan's thesis is that democracy and equality as represented in the De Constitution Declaration were made possible by racial oppression. Sean, next slide. 
Morgan writes, the slavery of Afro-Americans made possible indeed was essential for the emergence of the notion of equality as the fundamental, and we've heard this throughout our education. Come one more, Sean. Racism made it possible for white Virginians to develop a devotion to the equality. Go back one, Sean. Just, you know, go back. Well, if slavery brought us all these liberties, mustn't have been such a bad thing, huh? If racism brought us all this good stuff later on, it mustn't have been, that's the argument that they're putting forth. Allen stands all of this on his head. When he talks about Bacon's rebellion, he, he argues rather than the, the um, slavery being the base, he goes, it was only by extending what were liberties in England as racial privileges in Virginia that the US, that the plantation bourgeoisie was able to impose the system of racial slavery and racial oppression. We'll get into that. Come on. Okay, Sean. So here's Allen. He sets out the right books. Okay, now we're going to get into the books. <laughs> All right, The Invention of the White Race. All right, two volumes. Go on. S scholars. Scholars, here's five of them right here, have described Allen's work as a classic. I, for those who came in early, I had 55 quotes from different people on the, how important this work is. They're on my web page. You can read them with photos. You should read what people say about this work. He says, I begin this work with one assumption. While some people may desire to be masters, all are, unborn, are born equally unwilling, that basic egalitarian premise. And from that, all else will follow. All right, volume one, here's, um, here's the contents. And uh, I highlighted a few things. He's talking about racial oppression, social control. He's talking about Ireland. I'll explain why in a second, Sean. Uh, very thoroughly documented with his footnotes into marriage, Mountjoy's starvation strategy for Ireland, Scottish slavery, um, English plantations, go on. Allen has precision with words. Again, I want to do these next three words just to give people a little food for thought since these are things we might hear out there often. He subtitled volume one, uh, volume two, the origin of racial oppression in Anglo-American. Not the origins. Origin. Singular. Sean? He goes, origin has the desired specificity, like Darwin's origin of species and Engel's origin of the family, right? I meant it to be consistent with the argument of the book. It's rooted in class struggle, the system of racial oppression that's imposed, right? It's not some, it's not uh, any pre, natural or pre-American prejudice. It's, it's origin, not origins. Next. On whiteness. This is an, I, I worked 33 years, bulk mail center in Jersey City. A lot of place. I never heard this phrase once until, <laughs> you know, they come to the academy, right? But people talk about it all the time now, whiteness, right? And Alan, just so you know, he personally stayed away from the phrase. He explained it's an abstraction. It's an attribute of some people. It's not the role they play. The white race is an actual objective thing, not biological, but political. It functions. It, and he goes, it's historically developed identity of Europeans. It functions, and it has to be dealt with, right? To slough it off under the heading of whiteness, to me, seems to get away from the basic white race identity trauma. One last Allen on words, and then we get into the story. Um, he, you'll read, uh, you'll read uh, that this book is about the origins of racism. Allen couldn't be more emphatic. He goes, my book is not about and does not pretend to be about racism. It is about the white race, the true peculiar institution, its origin and method of functioning as the most general form of class co collaboration. He goes further and he goes, indeed, I generally stay away from using the, the word racism because of the ambiguity that uh, the ruinous ambiguity which white supremacists have managed to put because race, if you use racism in general, oh, black people are racist, you know, you get all that. He goes, no, the focus is on white supremacism. If I've ever forced to use it, I'll use white racism, put it in quotes, but focus on what I'm talking about. Okay, purpose of volume one. The reason Alan writes volume one, and he, I should have had this here, he, he's, he thinks the real stumbling block is this whole notion of basing our understanding of race on phenotype. So he goes, in volume one, he wants to cut the ground under from that understanding of race. Go on. Um, he begins by reviewing the debate over 
um, slavery, racism, which came first. It's very interesting. That's the introduction. It's a very worthwhile read for people. He's, he reviews a lot of the historians' good points and bad points. John? Um, he divides the historians who've written on that topic into two basic categories, the psychocultural, Jordan, Degler, socioeconomic, um, and he mentions a number of them, including Morgan, you know, the Hanlins, Eric Williams, people may be familiar with. And he says he wants to strengthen this side of the argument because there are certain apparent weaknesses amongst the socioeconomics. Of all the historians writing in that early period when he's starting now in the 70s, the one who he thinks really nails it pretty well is Lerone Bennett, Jr. If people are not familiar with Bennett, Bennett's a Morehouse graduate. He's the senior editor of Ebony Magazine for many years. He writes before the Mayflower, which many people have read, a host of other very important books, including his book, The Shaping of Black America, which I highly recommend, particularly chapter three, The Road Not Taken, right? And Bennett places the argument on the three, what Allen calls the three essential bearing points from which it cannot be toppled. And these are similar to what Allen argues, that those three main theses, right? Go on, Sean. Um, then in volume one, he, Allen goes on to look at some of the absurdities of race as we currently <coughs> use the phrase, right? So he talks about colonial Hispanic America. There was a policy of purchasing of whiteness. Brazil, it said money whitens. U.S., no such whitening could occur. Come on. Um, 1890, a Portuguese immigrant goes, it was British Guiana back then, now it's Guyana, right? Could go there and learn that he or she was not white, but that a sibling or, or even that same person could arrive in the U.S. and learn that they were white here, right? Next one. This one I really like, 1907, same year, same country. The last Spanish census, right? Spanish are moving out, U.S. is moving in. Last Spanish census, Mexican Indians and Chinese were classified as white. In the first U.S. census, they classified as colored, and so on and so forth. Here's all the, the tortured one-fourth, one-sixteenth, one drop, same state, right? And, and go on. And, yeah, it's, it's worth reading and probably sharing with friends. Sean, flip, we we'll, we'll keep moving. All right, one more flip. <coughs> okay, in the first of such absurdities, Allen wants to approach racial oppression as a sociogenic, as a social, <laughs> sociological uh, factor, not based on biology and skin color. So he says, I'm going to look at, and he also wants to look not on why the bourgeoisie had recourse to slavery. Basically, he believes they'll do it whenever they can get away with it, right? But rather on how they could establish that degree of social control. And he, this is just interesting for people who want to follow his arguments more closely. He understands racial slavery as what develops in this country, which I'm going to explain why, and that's a particular form of racial oppression, and he argues that when racial slavery ends, racial oppression still is reinforced, and, and that's why um, uh, that question of why 100 years later we still have it, because all the core characteristics that existed under racial slavery uh, re 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 retain with the racial oppression, and we'll go into that. Go on. Um, uh, Okay, then, thanks, Sean. The anatomy, by examining racial oppression, so he wants to look at the nature of the oppression, just as one would look at gender oppression or national oppression. He says there's firmer uh, footing for analyzing its invention and, particular, and peculiar functioning and for confronting the theory that racial oppression can be explained in terms of tint, skin type. This is very important. Again, this is what I was trying to recall a second ago. But he considers this phenotype, this skin-based <coughs> argument, as the, the, they're basically the old ace in the hole of the racist. You know, that's, they want to condition us to think that way. All right, coming on. So in order to deal with this, in order to look at the nature of the racial oppression, he takes a bold step. People had hinted at it before, but nobody did it with the thoroughness. I don't think that Alan did. He looks in an Irish mirror. And he basically argues that if we look closely at Irish history in Ireland, it presents a case of racial oppression without reference to skin color or phenotype. And why? Because Irish and English, you know, the oppressor English, basically the same color, right? Go on. His core argument is, and this is what several of the chapters in volume one are devoted, because he's trying to cut the ground from the race-based analysis, so we look at the nature. Anglo-Norman rule back 1300 or so, and Protestant ascendancy from 1652 on, when it's religio-racial oppression in Ireland, 
And white supremacy in continental America demonstrate that racial oppression is not dependent on differences of phenotype. This is one of the arguments he makes. And he, draw, he draws out in detail the parallels of the treatment of the Irish in Ireland by the British, which people familiar with African American history would recognize right away. You say, oh my god, this is so similar, right? I mean, it's striking. Specific examples of racial oppression that he talks on the book, but the main ones he focuses on these two, but also American Indians in the 19th century he talks about, and we can talk later about why he focuses on that period. Essential elements of discrimination. Again, people familiar with African American history are going to know this, but he talks about how in the early period there's the um, destroying the original forms of social identity, right? African, you have African chieftains coming here being slave, right? and exclude the oppressed group from admittance into the forms of social identity normal to the colonizing power. That's two of the early characteristics. Go on, Sean. He lists four characteristics of racial oppression, goes into detail how they existed you know, in, in 18th century Virginia. And of course, if you look at these and update them, we still all have variants of each one of the four today, right? The declassing legislation, deprivation of civil rights, illegalization of literacy and displacement of family rights. Go on, Sean. He considers the hallmark of racial oppression the reduction of all members of the press group to one undifferentiated social state, the Dred Scott decision. Sean. He, he emphasizes that the ruling elite has two principal tasks. We should never lose sight of this. They seek to maximize profit, but they have to maintain social control, right? And go on, Sean. So Allen offers two general principles of social control regarding problems of the colonizing power. And this is very instructive when we look at what happens in the US versus the Caribbean versus Latin America in particular, right? But um, he goes, in general, these are the general, again, I want to get some thoughts out there so people can look and maybe get sparked to look further into this. After establishing commanding authority, the co uh, colonizing power pursues one of two general lines of policy, Sean. Where they found a developed and well-defined hierarchical system, the Aztecs, the Incas, right, is a hierarchy. The new rulers sought to adapt the pre-existing social structures to their own needs, co-opting amenable elements and using them as a buffer and social control strata, right? That's one approach. Sean, next one. However, where they encountered a society with no previously developed hierarchy like that. And he's talking now to Spanish in the Caribbean, and particularly this one, the English in North America, right, which is one that's going to focus on. The conquerors employed a policy tending to the complete elimination of the indigenous population, which is what happens in, in the Caribbean, by slaughter and or expulsion, forcing them out, you know, which is what happens in Virginia, right? They keep moving the Indians out. Uh, and, but then, as they remove the native population, in this second situation, the colonized have to seek foreign supplies of labor to produce that profit, right? If they're not going to be able to force it on the people there, then they've got to get a, a labor supply, and it's got to be a labor supply that they can control. And this is getting very deeply into how the US, what we know as the US, differs from elsewhere. Go on. Um, Here's his quote. I like this one about the slaughter and expulsion. Bourgeoisie could care less, right? Looks upon progress indifferently. Sean, next. Um, OK, he, he lays out a little schema for, in general, the social structure of class societies. He, he's using the phrase buffer social control stratum. It's basically the people in the middle who um, live in relative economic security, subordinate to the ruling class, day-to-day -day contact with the regular folks, people at the bottom with no productive wealth. Go on. Um, in differences in so a key distinction between national oppression and racial oppression. And he makes this distinction throughout both volumes. This is very important, I think, for people, because we use these phrases, a lot of us now. He says the key, one of the key distinctions is the source from which the social control stratum is recruited, whether it's from the oppressed or the oppressor group. Uh, Sean, under a system of racial oppression, Social control depends upon denial of the legitimacy of social distinctions. That's what we knew in, in 18th century Virginia, right? Under national oppression, social control depends upon the acceptance and fostering of social distinctions. You're a national bourgeoisie, if you will, right? Come on. Um, 
under racial oppression in Virginia, any person of, discernible, of discernible non-European ancestry after Bacon's Rebellion, after they start setting up this system, were denied a role in the social control buffer. Whereas in contrast, in the Caribbean, mulattoes were included in the social control group and were promoted to middle class status. And that's, we saw, we see in St. Croix, Jamaica, Barbados. We're talking Anglo-Caribbean now. Come on, John, sorry. Um, so he says that this difference was the key to understanding the difference in the policy between Virginia's ruling class policy, because Virginia do, not only doesn't include any African Americans in the policy, but they fix a perpetual brand on every African American. He explains why and how this again differs from what is done elsewhere, right? I, one, one statistic, and people can think about this, in Jamaica, on the eve of emancipation, 23% of the enslaved African labor force were owned by people of color. It's a qualitative difference, right? Come on. Uh, the difference was rooted in the objective fact that in the West Indies, there were too few laboring class Europeans to embody an adequate petty bourgeoisie. And this gets to do with that demographics again. Remember St. Croix, only, you only got 5% European. There's no poor whites. So you can't base your social control system on them. Whereas in Virginia, for example, there were, a pro there were so many, and I'm, we're going to get into why and, and how Virginia develops and how Anglo-America, uh, the plantation colonies, develop. So the difference is rooted. West Indies, there were too few laboring class Europeans, while in the continental colonies, there were too many to be promoted to the petty bourgeoisie, next middle class. All right. He also talks about the transition from racial to national oppression. He's going to try and show the relativity of race. So he talks about how the British West Indies and Ireland, in the British West Indies, they try and impl implement the same system that they try and do down in Virginia, but it doesn't work because of those demographics and because it's a small area and the plantations and small, you know, small uh, growers can't compete with the plantations. There's no room, right? So, um, and, and in both cases, in both, the British West Indies and Ireland, the colonial ruling elite, faced with a combination of insurrectionary pressures, resolved the, this situation by the decision to recruit elements of the oppressed group. That's what we see in the Anglo-Caribbean. We're well, not yet sure. And that's what we see in Ireland, right? All right, so he talks about how the, it, he, he talks about this. So what you have is you have a situation where it's the same Anglo bourgeoisie, the British bourgeoisie in Ireland in the Caribbean and in Virginia, but they develop different systems of social control based on the necessity of the situation. He's trying to undercut this argument that it's based on skin color, right? Because whereas we know, you know African Americans have no rights, but it's different in the Caribbean. Uh, we, we, we're not used to thinking in terms of these Irish have no rights, you know, in Ireland, right, under the British, right? But that, that's the situation, so come on now. Um, come on. No, no parallel. So um, he t uh, this, is, this is the major difference that he uh, uh, elaborates then, national oppression, racial oppression. This is what we, we, we talked about, Harrison, McKay, Garvey. They're all coming from this situation of national oppression, where they're not used to this virulent white supremacy that they encounter in the US. Show on next slide. Um, he, cl he starts to close volume one, get ready for volume two, by talking about how in the um, period after emancipation, there's a conscious ruling class decision to once again turn to a system of racial oppression. And what he, uh, he talks about is key, how they set up the white privilege systems in key things, free, in the land policy, the immigration policy, and industrial employment. One more, Sean. So, and the last chapter of volume one, I think is very instructive, particularly for people here in New York, because it talks about New York City. And it talks about the Irish. And the wave of Irish that comes in mid 19th century comes to New York and points out and describes how these Irish immigrants are victims of racial oppression in Ireland. And they come here and they become opponents of abolition, supporters of slavery, and viciously anti white, uh, uh, white supremacist opponents of African Americans, right? And he ties it again to the 
forces that are driving that. New York, people may know during Civil War, big tie, Fernando Wood wanted to go, the mayor of New York wanted to you know, align with the southern states, right? And um, because it was financial interest, right? And he talks about the southern slaveocracy interests and the Catholic Church hierarchy, Irish American establishment, Catholic press, Tammany Hall. These are the forces really driving this making, you know, th this force to make these Irish white, right? White. They, they're, here they're vi victims and vicious opponents of the British. And all of a sudden things are changing here. Okay, so now we go to volume two. This is what he called the, the, his, you know, his, his best work. This is it. It's about 17th century Virginia. This is what he did all that research on. Virginia founded 1607, Jamestown. Key dates, 1622. We're going to talk about this. 1670, reduction to chattel labor status. Bacon's Rebellion, revisal of Virginia laws. Sean. Okay, this is the outline of the chapters. Next one. And again, the appendices. And see, he's getting into maroon communities, the bond labor system. The ruling class decision. Now, when, when we did these new books, I should tell you, I'm going to encourage people to get them. They've got new introductions. They've got new additional uh, appendices that I put in there. Background on his thought and what he's doing. But what they also have, each volume has a 25-page study guide so you can get through them. Because these are not easy to get through. And there's greatly expanded indexes which also get into the notes. So uh, the purpose of doing this was so you could really get into and look. You want to look up maroon societies? Here's all the pages, you know, things like that. All right, going on. Um, okay, two cha common challenges faced by the European colonizing powers. After, this is what we described a little before. They have to sec uh, secure a supply of labor and establish a system of social control. That's the two key tasks, right? Once they come, they've got to colonize. Here's where the English differ from all the other European colonizing powers. That's why it's different in Spain or Portugal. In both those respects, the Anglo-American plantation bourgeoisie differs from the other. Sean? Spain and Portugal had no surplus laboring population. They came as conquistadores, right? But, uh, but the population density in Peru and Mexico afforded them a supply of labor. When the Caribbean peoples were exterminated and when the enslavement of Brazilians um, proved you know, not workable because they had a great continental expanse to free, uh, flee to, they turned to African laborers for plantation. France tried to send some, Europe, some French workers for a while called engagés, but it, it didn't work. They were high wages. And on these islands, again, you can't compete with the big plantations, right? And come back. And it was also on the supply route. Um, Santo Domingo, Haiti, Dominican Republic, was on the supply route direct from Africa, the way the, the currents came and stuff. Sean, come on. Holland was major, major, had major involvement in the trade of African laborers, right? But it had no surplus labor for export. So its main role was supplying plantation labor from Africa. England is different. It had a surplus of necessitous poor, needy poor, because it had gone, undergone an agricultural transformation, a capitalist transformation. They closed the monasteries, right? They, they, they're kicking people off the land. There's enclosures, right? People are wandering around. They're vagabonds. And I'm not exaggerating, because they pass laws. They try and enslave the vagabonds. In 1547 is the attempt to enslave the vagabonds. Uh, the source of labor was cheaper than any alternative source. And it was cheaper. For the English, this was the cheapest labor source. This, this, you know, because they had them right there, and they could get them over there. Come on. Key difference of all the European colonizing powers, only England used European workers as basic plantation laborers. We're going to talk about the difference. Why is it different in the US than the Caribbean and stuff? This starts pointing us in the direction. Next. So the uniqueness was not that it came in the chattel labor form. The chattel labor form is all the various forms of bondage and what we call slavery. That was throughout the Americas nor that there were non-Europeans involved. That was throughout the Americas. What was unique about the plantation colony, Virginia, Maryland, and Allen, let me just say, Allen focuses on Virginia because that's where it starts. That's the pattern setting colony. But that's the founding, seven of the first 12 presidents are out of Virginia. This is setting the tone and the pace. And it's, it's the model that's copied later on. OK, so Allen argues the peculiarity was not in the supply um, aspect of bond labor, particularly 
but it was in the control specifically um, uh, in that, in, that what they wound up developing in the US, any person of degree of non-European ancestry was excluded, and the buffer social control stratum was made up of free proletarians and semi-proletarians. Sean, next. Um, regarding the English background, he does some nice little background, what you were just asking. He reviews some key uh, uh, um, developments in the history of development of capitalism in England, Sean. What is very important is um, in 1547, there was an attempt to enslave English in England and there's a rebellion and they fight and they beat it back and they establish some common law <coughs> principles and he talks about other reasons why they didn't persist in that because of the cost-benefit analysis which he goes into. Alan, Alan is a very trained economist. He, I said he was a coal miner and stuff. He comes to New York. He teaches at the Jefferson School which was a communist party school for many. He leaves the communist party but he teaches economics there, Marxist economics. He teaches the Labor Research Association. Brilliant. He understands the economics, right, really well. Next. Here's a key thing. So what happens 1563 in England, the law is passed, and this is the labor law of England for the next 200 plus years. The statute of artifices. And basically two key aspects of it for our purpose right here. There would be no slavery and laborers were to be paid wages. This is what we call the rights of an Englishman, if you will, right? This is, if you will. Um, and, and so that's the law of the land of England who's coming to Virginia. This is their law, and the people who come are English. This is what they, all right. So um, by, by 1607, the conditions had ripened, and there's some colonization efforts, Sean. All right. He, Allen analyzes and discusses, I think people will find this, people interested in history elsewhere in the Americas, situations in different uh, parts of America, particularly the Euro-Indian uh, relations, and then he turns to Virginia. He points out a few key aspects about Virginia. It's a continental colony, not an insular one. So that means there's routes of escape unless you set up a system of social control that can contain. There's little significant stratification, particularly in Virginia, the area around Jamestown. The, the Native Americans living there are the Powhatan, right? And they're not a very stratified society, and it's a low population density. This is not going to serve the labor needs of the English, right? Um, but the Powhatan were well provisioned, they, they were, <laughs> and uh, for the first decade or two, they actually had the preponderance of force in terms of the Virginia colony. And this comes up, and this, some of this stuff I find striking too. Alan makes some important points on why the European powers didn't go deep into Africa, and it's because the Africans had the preponderance of force in the, in the, on the continent, you know, for you know, serious efforts to go in and move in, right? Um, but the Native American population around Jamestown could not be surrounded, could not be exterminated, could not be brought under that degree of administrative control. Sean? Virginia Company uh, Charter is set up in 1606, and the, the members of the Virginia Company shall have all liberty franchise, all the rights of an Englishman, quote again, if you will. Um, there's a quantitative change in labor relations in 1622, right? Statute of Artifices, uh, artifices says that wages will be paid and all labor is free. Throw that out. 1622. At the beginning of 1622, most of the laborers were tenants at half. They were producing tobacco. That was the crop. After 1616, tobacco was the crop in Virginia, right? Producing tobacco, you're working on a, 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 an estate, a plantation. Um, you work, you keep half of what you produce, right? That's the main form, but there's also la wage labor, right? By the spring of 1623, what's going on is an, a massive a reduction of tenants to servants, to bond servants, to chattel bond servants, people who could be bought and sold. And this is being done primarily on European Americans, because the first Africans only come in 1619. There's not that many yet, right? You know, N not because of that, but I'm just saying it, it's the European Americans. All right, here's the key date. We got the anniversary coming up in another month and a half. 22 March, 1622, on that day, the Powhatan Indians arise under their chief and fearing the English would dispossess them, mounted what was to be, in relative terms, the strongest effort ever made to halt the Anglo-American occupation of Indian lands. First day, they wipe out one third of the colony. One day, right? Within the next year, more would die from privation of the survivors, two thirds were not fit for work, Sean. So what happens in the aftermath of this attack, and this is pre-Naomi Klein, all this shock doctrine. Uh, in the aftermath of the attack, and concerned about attritional attack, 
the colony authorities forbade planting of corn. That's what the people were eating. That was the main crop, right? Corn and, and near dwellings. So you couldn't even grow food to eat. You weren't, um, the perimeter was constricted. You couldn't go out because they were fearful of Native American attack. Uh, half the landholders were dead. Corn supplies were limited. The price of corn goes up eightfold in one year. Uh, the, the value of their labor for tobacco goes down. They're totally vulnerable, a laboring population. Sean. For the elite, the colony elite embarked on a scheme whereby tenants and workers were reduced to unpaid long-term bond laborers, right? They're imposing chattel bondage on these Euro primarily European Americans after the, towards the end of 1622 and thereafter. Uh, their, their laboring class is dependent on the bourgeoisie. They're compelled to submit. By the, 60, the spring of 1622, contracts were appearing containing unprecedented provisions uh, allowing the employer to dispose of the servants to the employer's heirs and assigns. They are now chattel. They can be bought, sold, passed on, right? Um, go on. He, Alan refers to this as the massacre of the uh, tenantry. Sean? It's a qualitative break from English labor law. When you hear your history today, they talk about indentured servants, you know. It's euphemisms, Europeans different than average. You know, it's all code words, a lot of this stuff. The break from the statute of artificers, it's a qualitative break. This is not any carryover from English labor law. It's not a feudal carryover. Under feudalism, uh, there's a two-way bondage. The serf and the lord each had obligations to the other. Here, it's a one-way bondage. You've got no say. You can be bought and sold. It's being imposed as custom of the country. That's the phrase in, phrase in the records. These aren't indentures. These aren't people willingly signing, you know, yeah, put me, you know, signing in London. Yeah, put me in bond servitude. And it, it's being imposed in Virginia. And it's not apprenticeship which is some of the rationales that historians have used. Here's some of the stats. Of the 92,000 Euro European immigrants brought to Virginia between 1607 and 82, more than three quarters were chattel bond laborers. Not the history we've been taught necessarily, right? 1676, Governor William Barclay estimated 1,500 a year, um, English, few Scots and few Irish. Such recruitment was generally coercive. Few were wholehearted volunteers, kidnappings, ordinary convict, convicts, still others prisoners taken in rebellion and, and, and exiled. I saw statistics yesterday, the, what they called the Irish slave trade, which went to, primarily to the Caribbean, but also up here, 300,000 in a 10-year period, right? I mean, this is, I mean, some of the numbers are staggering, right? Come on, um, Sean. Oh, well, you did, thank you. Okay, now this is what, this is important, and you see this in Lerone Bennett, and Allen elaborates on this. Very important. In this 17th century, particularly mid-17th century, the early years, right, conditions for African-American, European-American uh, laborers and chattel bond servants were very similar. Through 1676, and at that time, the time of Bacon's Rebellion, three-quarters of the bond servants were still European-Americans, right? Um, in fact, the conditions were very hard. I'm not saying this was a Garden of Eden, right, or your paradise or whatever. They, they didn't survive their first year, many of them, right, in the, particularly in the early years. Um, but again, 17th century, most of the plantation laborers were chattel bond servants. Sean? <coughs> Status of African Americans. Again, this is not the Kunta Kinte version of history, where Kunta Kinte comes and encounters a full-blown system. 17th century Virginia was very different. In 17th century Virginia, African Americans, not all, right, but not all English either, right, uh, exercised marriage rights, exhibited social mobility, had, some had significant land holding, some were uh, owners of European American bond laborers. They manifested many forms of resistance. Some voted, they had voting rights, right? Come on. 17th century, the record makes clear, and this is how Allen sums up based on going through all those primary records. The relative social status of African Americans and European Americans at that time can be determined to have been indeterminate. It was being fought out, and it wasn't white against black, because there was no white yet, right? There were other factors in the class struggle, and the issue of slavery and freedom was being fought out. Sean, next. Here's an example, and this is a very important one, particularly people interested in, in family history, women's history, 
so much and, and so key to the system that winds up getting developed. This is the case of Elizabeth Key. And this is another form. Alan goes page after page of the various forms of resistance, <coughs> running away, fighting, going to court, you know, all the different ways, you know, uh, that people chose to resist and, and decided to resist. Elizabeth Key was a child of a European-American father and an African-American mother. She was scheduled to complete her term of service when the estate she was bonded to sought to impose lifetime bond servitude. Now there were these efforts by the ruling class to try and impose bond servitude, to try and lengthen the servitude of people, to try and impose bond servitude. But this contradicted the English common law principle, partis sequitur patrum, forgive my Latin. The condition of the child was the condition of the father. That's the law in England. This is still an English colony. She goes to court, Elizabeth Key, and she argues two things. John. She argues that um, on the basis of traditional principle that her Christian baptism and rearing barred her from being held as a slave. We have some precedent for that in the, in the, uh, in the law and uh, the, just in general, in the, uh, not so much in the law, but in, in the principle it was upheld often. And the common law principle that the social status of the child followed that of the father. That's her argument in court. And she prevails. She wins. Six years later, they got to change that. They're moving in a different direction. Because the implications are, well, they change it and they take a different course and they, they say no. They, they, not in her case, but in a different case, they establish the principle of partis sequitur ventrum, descent through the mother. Because this means all of those women, those chattel bond servant women, who are taken advantage of by men, right? Their children will be chattel bond servants, right? And this is what the system needs, right? But that's not the way it was first. So there's people like historians like Gutman and people like this write about the Af history of the African American family. They start in 1790 and stuff. This is so significant because it's a qualitative change, right? And people, this Elizabeth Key case I think is very important. <laughs> status of African Americans. So what Alan's arguing, the white race system of racial oppression did not and could not have existed in the 17th century. He bases it on the following facts. Class solidarity, which we're going to get into. The absence of an all-class coalition of European Americans. Tremendous class differences, right? Lack of substantial intermediate stratum. Sean? The white race did not exist. The attitude of laboring class Europeans stood in sharp contrast to the plantation bourgeoisie. He emphasizes the invention of the white race cannot be ascribed to demands by European American laboring people for privileges. It's not coming from below, right? Sean? All right. <coughs> the road to, then he talks about social factors that lead up to Bacon's Rebellion. Bacon's Rebellion, 1676. Price of tobacco drops in 1660. Conditions really get bad. There's no intermediate social control stratum. There's oppressive conditions. And uh, there's no white worker component functioning. Sean, next. So the statistics at the time of Bacon's Rebellion, roughly 8,000 bond servants, 6,000 European American, 2,000 African Americans. There would be a continuous influx of European Americans uh, uh, until the end of the century, European Americans coming as bond laborers primarily. African bond laborers were imported, but still it's not the big turn. The Royal African Company is not even set up until the 1670s, right? So it's not like the African, the big influx of Africans are coming. Come on, Sean. That is about the Africans in the uh, 1672 Royal African Company uh, established. Come on. Here's Bacon's Rebellion. This is the big one that Alan focuses on. There had been 10 preliminary <coughs> bond servant and laboring class rebellions leading up to it in that period from 1660. Um, it began in 1676 as a difference between the elite and the sub elite. Basically, in Virginia, the elite planters liked things the way they were. They're the elite. They're fine with the way things are. The sub-elite were the planters on the make. They wanted to start building big plantations, so they wanted to push further. That meant pushing against the Native Americans who were on the perimeter, right? And so it starts out as an elite, sub-elite struggle over Indian policy. But it so often happens when the elite and the sub-elite go into conflict, right? People at the bottom of society get involved, right? And they take it in a different direction. So it's the second Civil War stage of Bacon's Rebellion. The rebels, European-American, African-American, rise up. They besiege the capital. They take control. They burn Jamestown. They kick the governor 
uh, across the bay, and they control much of the land for months, right? According to Governor Barkley, six-sevenths of the people are poor, discontented, and armed, right? This is what social control was a serious problem in 1676, Virginia. Uh, uh, it, uh, go on. Uh, go on. I, we've been through this, all right? Um, here's uh, when the, when the uh, Bacon's rebel, uh, Rebellion is finally put down, there's this account, which I showed you early in the session, of Thomas Grantham. Um, and um, Grantham's account, again, here, 400 English and Negroes in arms. You have European Americans and African Americans fighting together for freedom from bondage. You won't see that for the next 300 years. Down south, you, you know, arguments can be made. Come on. Um, supreme proof, Allen argues, that the white race did not exist. Um, they fought side by side for the abolition of slavery. Sean, come on. Counterfeit of so what happens in response is the ruling class turns to a counterfeit of social mobility. They're not going to promote these European American laborers out of their class, but they're going to sell them a different bill of goods, right? Instead of social mobility, European Americans were to be asked to be satisfied with the presumption of liberty, which is a birthright of everyone in England, right? You know, uh, and with the right of adult males who own sufficient property to vote for candidates for office. Sean. Virginia General Assembly deliberately stuffed the racial distinction with anomalous privileges, right? Uh, go on. Uh, revised the code. 1705, they granted guarantees to the European Christian servants. Now uh, you finish your bond, ser your bond servitude, you're European, you get 10 bushels of corn, you get a gun. Go on, Sean. Um, 1705, Act Concerning Servants and Slaves in 1723. These are major laws. But they, they're not only passing these laws extending privileges to the European Americans and disabilities on the African Americans, but they're propagandizing it in the method of the day. This is pre-internet and TV and everything. So it's put on every parish, church, and wall, and sheriffs post them at the courthouse door. And pe it's drummed into the people. Come on, Sean. Propaganda, it was to be drummed into the minds of the people for the first time. No free African American was to dare lift a hand. African American freeholders were not allowed, no longer allowed to vote. They had been allowed to, right? Um, a, a reinforcement against the mating of English and ne Negroes, right? Provided in the 1723 law, um, any white person found in company with any illegally congregated slaves was to be fined um, or to receive lashes. Sean? Um, 1723 Act, and this is where we really get into the nature of racial oppression, to, it is aimed. They an act directing the trial of slaves it's got a long title, but this is where they take away the vote of African Americans. They formally take it away, and they explain. Governor William Gluch explained that it was the, the law says no free Negro, no free Negro, mulatto or Indian shall have any vote at the election. And Governor William Gooch explains it is to f fix a perpetual brand upon free Negroes. Now you might ask, why free Negroes? Right? You know? Here we go. So Allen emphasizes, surely that's not an unthinking decision, which is what Winthrop Jordan says, right? You know, racism. You know. Rather, it was a deliberate act by the plantation uh, bourgeoisie. Sean? In addition, that act of 1723, I'm going to come back to it in a second, uh, other aspects of it. It had laws against free African Americans, including making Negro women tithable, how to pay taxes for them, forbidding of non-Europeans, to be owners of Christians, denying free African Americans right to hold any office, um, excluding African Americans from the armed militia, that's the Lily White Slave Patrol, forbidding free African Americans from possessing any gun, powder, shot, or any club. Next, Sean. The denial of the right to self-defense would become a major factor in the peculiar American form of male supremacy, white male supremacy, which held that any European American male could assume familiarity, because African Americans were not allowed to defend themselves. Sean, next. Um, why the exclusion of free African Americans? Um, the real reason for the exclusion of free African Americans from the intermediate stratum was a corollary of the establishment of white identity. If you're not going to promote these laboring class European Americans out of their class, you've got to give them something, you know, sell them something. So they're selling them this white identity, and the white identity has to exclude the African Americans. So this is part of the reason why the racial prescription. Come on. And this is what we see today. I mean, well, people can get into it, you know. Why the exclusion of, all right, the mere presumption of liberty was to serve as social status. Um, the presumption of liberty had to be denied to free African Americans. 
Next, John. How was it done? Um, they were enlist the white European Americans were listed in a system of social control, not by class interest, but by being promoted to the white race, Sean. Uh, the white race social control formation, Alan then argues, we're almost at the end of the book now, as a model, it was reinvented in, in ensuing southern colonies. Uh, in Virginia, Maryland would serve as the model uh, for succeeding plantation settlement. Next. The poor and populous Europe European Americans became principal elements in the enforcement of racial oppression. The white slave patrols were made up primarily of laboring class people, Sean. Laborers not promoted out of their class. Here's statistics. Remember Morgan writes that they're too few free poor to matter? Here's the, st excuse me, the stats from other historians which ultimately argued that 60% of the adult white male population were not owners of bond labor and were in direct competition, laboring, you know, small landholders. They couldn't compete with the, the plantation elite. Come on, John. Um, the decision uh, was driven, uh, different ways of making would be required. He talks about different ways of slash, uh, Sean will come, I want to go fast here. He again emphasizes the difference in the social control and the status of uh, free colleges and mulattoes in the West Indies opposed to the US, and, and it reflects different forms that the class struggle took. Sean, uh, he again highlights, as he did at the end of the first volume, that after emancipation, the Nor northern bourgeoisie opts again to reestablish a system of racial oppression, which he says, um, if I don't have it here, I have it on the next page, which he uses the phrase, and they set up a system of, uh, of slavery in all but name, you know, whatever that book is that's out there now. <laughs> Say, you see the phrase here 15 years earlier. Uh, free land, immigration, industrial employment is uh, where they set up the uh, white privilege policies. He d it goes into some detail in Negro Exodus of 1879, which gets beat back by terror. Cotton mill campaign, Lily White cotton mill campaign in the South. Sean? He's closing in 1997. That's when he finishes the volume, and he, he sums up here. But what he wrote in 1907 could have been written yesterday. This is, what we, this is what we see right now. At the end of the 20th century, the social gap between the titans and the common people is at its historic maximum. Real wages have tended down. Entitlements and welfare, all the code words, have become obscenities. There is less of a socialist movement today than 100 years ago. Class struggle is an epithet. You know, people don't even utter the word, right? We don't even talk working class. Eh? Next, John. Uh, he looked forward, however, to a time when the safe, great safety valve of white skin privileges may finally come to be seen and, re re uh, and rejected. He described unmistakable signs, this is Allen at the end of the book, of maturing, come back, of maturing social conflict. And he emphasized the importance that why things were different now than previously is the indelible mark left by that civil rights black liberation movement. We, we, we had the way forward pointed. Last couple slides, a few slides, Sean. Okay, his final words, perhaps by virtue of that legacy, the great safety valve uh, of white skin privilege may be clean, seen and rejected. The incubus, an incubus is a devil. The incubus that for three centuries has paralyzed the will uh, of these European American workers in defense of their class interests, Sean. Shortly before his death, Allen offered uh, four, um, you know, recommendations for work forward. Sean, I want to go on now. I want the last three slides. So here he is wrapping it up, Sean. To looking further, uh, I would point people again as we leave. I would hope you would remember the lessons of the three previous crises, what he elaborated, and how in each and every one they beat us back by turns to white supremacy. Sean, if you can remember that five-stage cycle and how stage three. As people start coming together, they're gonna, there's going to be conscious efforts to divide us on white supremacy and white privilege. Sean, next. The crucial importance of anti-white supremacist working class struggle at all stages, but particularly stage, stage three and four. Sean, keep in mind that the struggle has to be led by anti-white supremacist proletarian class hegemony. Um, Sean. Remember, last two slides, remember the insights of Hubert Harrison is my suggestions. Uh, that politically the Negro is a touchstone and that true democracy and equality implies a revolution startling to even think of it. You know, it hits at the core of how they do it and if we push in that direction, we're gonna open many doors. And finally, John, remember Allen, the white race is created and maintained as a social control formation it is the principal historic guarantor of ruling class domination in the U.S. It, it, it reinforced among Europeans by white skin privileges. 
and efforts at radical social change should understand and reflect the centrality of struggling against white supremacy. That's it. Ancient oppression, you mean of Europeans going elsewhere in the world? Organizing and doing those types of things. Whereas I see, when I look back at all, all, all the history that I can recall, um, I see that European uh, countries were able to come together at some point to help oppress other people. For example, Africa. There was a conference in which you know France and Belgium and all these all these countries came together to colonize and you know split the difference in Africa and oppress these people. And so when, he's, when you're talking about the myth of uh, the white race, it seems as if it's all, it always existed, regardless of the language. Well, I think what you're talking about, if you're talking about in the 19th century when they come up about the division of Af Africa, th that's kind of a later period. Alan's really not discussing that. He's trying to talk, and I just want to be clear, he's not talking about the myth of the right white race. He's, he's saying the white race is real. It functions. It's a political reality. It's not biological. You know, it's created, right? And, and, uh, and he even says reinvented and recreated. But I think it's become, in answer to your question also, I think because of particularly increasingly the U.S.'s powerful role, right, as the leading imperialist power in the world, you know, it spreads these ideas also, right? And other people, perhaps you, you know, Nellie in front of you, people like, you know, people write a lot more knowledgeably than I about, you know, all of this involvement um, around the world. What Alan's trying to focus on, I think, is he's trying to look at domestically, particularly, you know, what, is, what have we got to do to push this struggle forward? How are we going to deal with this white supremacy, which is so central to how they maintain control, not only over us, but then enabling them to do all this damage around the world? So I don't know if that exactly answers your question, but I'm trying. <laughs> yeah. So you had a model, you were talking about the difference between uh, U.S. and the Caribbean yes. and the number of whites compared to uh, darker-skinned peoples. How does that model compare to what happened in South Africa under apartheid when you had yeah. uh, a majority of uh, yeah. darker-skinned people? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And Alan, um, Alan's again focusing here, you know, but he's um, talking about um, social control for the most part, in stable civil societies, rather than just by pure military force, which is more what you had in, in South Africa, right? Um, which is what you had, you know, under apartheid, right? Um, so he, in neither of these two volumes does he really get into that. And uh, I think people who do work in those areas, um, you know, you know, could could shed light on it. But um, I, I, and I'm not sure fully, and maybe you know better than I. Um, the demographic breakdown. It, my, my, my understanding is the African population was so overwhelming, right, you know? Um, but rather than, than even promoting, even though they had colored status, you know, and things like that, rather than very much promotion, it was real military might and force. That, and he talks in the book, I didn't get into all this because obviously I did a lot of things, but he talks about how the ruling elite makes co uh, cost-benefit analysis, whether they have got to set up military regimes and things, for instance, after the Civil War, you know, to maintain a military presence down south, the, the bourgeoisie didn't want to spend all that money, right, at a certain point, you know. Let's go back to the old system of social control. So, um, but again, in answer to your question, as in, as it's not what Alan goes into particularly in these volumes or in his body of writings that I'm very familiar with. He some passing references occasionally to South Africa. Yes? Sorry? Go ahead. Yes. I'll speak loudly. So um, several racial theorists um, presume that we're now living in a post-racial society and uh, one that is uh, colorblind. So I was wondering uh, what you would say to 
those theorists as examples that we're not living in a post-racial society, that it's not colorblind and that it's racially well, categorized. Yeah. Um, if, 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 if I'm going to give you a quick answer, but I actually have a whole slide that can run, you know, ready. My developing conjuncture article, which I've encouraged people to read, I have a statistical breakdown. The basic argument I make in this, book, in, in, in this early part of the article is I show how the gap between rich and poor is widening, how poor and working people are suffering so greatly in this country, um, how, uh, by all measures, Gini coefficients, how, your, how workers in this country overall are faring so poorly compared to workers in other countries. We're, we spend the most on health care, we're 37th. Paternity leave, maternity leave, you know, paid vacations, every measure of international, we, our country is so far behind after I go through all of that because I want to make the point that European American workers are not benefiting by this system too because they're not. They're getting crushed. But then I get into the white supremacist shaping. Sean? Uh, yeah, here we go. Let's go here. Let's just look at some of the, the stats. Um, come, Sean, one at a time. Black unemployment. This, I did this about a year and a half, two years ago. 15 points. And that's, we know how they play with the unemployment numbers. Don't go to go slower, Sean. Might be slower. Thank you. Okay. Black, a two-way black poverty rate, three, roughly three times away. Come on, Sean, next. Ninety percent of black children will be on food stamps at some point in their life. Ninety percent. For the overall population, it's fifty percent. We're not doing that well. You can get these statistics in this article. Come on, Sean. The e equality <coughs> index. Um, this is the Urban League. Puts this out every year. I used the 2009 one. They've already got the 2012 out. They try and, and quantify, you know, put metrics on all these areas and how a black people can fare and compared to uh, the general population. Next, incarceration rates. I think Michelle Alexander has been doing very important work in this, but some of the statistics, as you know, it's the highest proportion in the world, right? Here, Jan M. Chaikin, Director of Bureau of Justice Statistics, 30% of black men ages 20, 29 under correctional supervision. A young black male, age 18, had almost a 30% chance of spending time in prison during his life, time being defined as one year. Sean, next. Stagger here, this, this, these numbers just blew me away when I came across them. Come back. 58.3% of milk. See, there was all this hubbub, and there are groups on the left saying, Madison is the revolution, right? You drive one and a half hours from, and when I looked at Madison, I saw Lily White. You know, I admit that, that's not that other people weren't involved, but I know a little about Wisconsin because I've been there. It's got a history of sundown towns, right? I mean, real, real sundown towns. You've got um, Milwaukee, which is the biggest city in the state, is the most segregated city. The gap between inner city and urban is the widest. The staggering 58% of Metro Milwaukee, and that's where Walker comes from, right outside. He comes from those suburbs right outside Milwaukee. African American males were not employed, and these are all the different categories. Unemployed, underemployed, blah, blah, blah. 58.3, and look at these cities. It's all over the country, right? So who's talking this post-racial stuff? Who, who'd you say it was? <laughs> 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 Sorry. Sorry. Now, now uh, thank you, Miriam. It just occurred to me, Miriam, I, I want to ask you something and bring Alan into the 21st century. Because the white ruling class, even though we have this illusion of a pr president for all, uh, he, he's just in black face. But they have a problem, and that's the birth dearth, that there are not enough white babies being born to maintain this illusion of white superiority through numbers. And so the ruling class is looking around for honorary whites to boast these numbers, and they need to do it because the social control mechanism is very, very much in demand when you look at the prison industrial complex and the fact that that is a billion dollar, multi-billion dollar uh, industry. When you look at all of these, uh, the, the runaway problems of, uh, of, of, of a 
of a capitalism that is in fact uh, 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 on the edge of the precipice if it hasn't uh, fallen off already. So there's a real problem with the white ruling class and at this time ironically with a black president the need for social control and this white supremacy on the domestic front as well as the international front is much more uh, is, is, is much more needed than ever because it is their profit and capitalism that is at stake. And what I, I hope you can talk about is how they're able to maintain this dichotomy with this illusion of a, this outright lie of a post-racial America and a black president who is really right of center, even more so than Bill Clinton, and how they are able to maintain this illusions while holding on to white supremacy and black subjugation at a time when black people are looking at their black president and find no fault. I mean, it's crazy. Well, you, you, but can you elaborate on that? I'll, I'll just offer some, <coughs> some thoughts. And Nellie, if people don't know, works with Black Agenda Report. She's got a radio show in New York. So she's dealing with these issues a lot. She's uh, uh, an important source, resource. Um, j just a few things. One, um, in terms of um, the post-racial, it seems to me, is largely I don't think that's so much in these all white enclaves and stuff that they're talking that. I think that's in the academy and you know Thank you. Soho and no where where are we? You know? Yeah. yeah, yeah, right, right. And and just I mean and they run it on some people who it will fly with for various reasons and people could get into that. Um, just a, but they've been successful with this whole white thing, even though it's not an interest of people for a long time. So they've got major resources of propaganda and dissemination. The demographics are um, an issue, right? Part of the response, and again, some of the work you and your publication do, that we talk about um, incarceration rates and denying of people rights, right? We talk about uh, disfranchisement of Latino vote, you know, things like this are going on, um, gerrymandering, right? There, there are all these issues um, to try and maintain the power of that white block that they have, these red states and these red districts. But there are other things also, I, I would say. One is, and Alan hints at this a little bit, and then he talks about it in, in some articles, but when the Irish come, they are victims of racial oppression in Ireland, and they become white here. There are other books, how the Jews became white, how this one became white, how that one became white. Very powerful forces in this country pressuring people to, quote, be or think white, and to learn fast that black is bad, you know, you don't want to be a, I mean, that's the way it works. And uh, just today on Hugh Hamilton, I don't know if people heard, he read a little thing, anybody hear it? Um, I think it was from Toni Morrison or something like that, way back, and she talks about it. It was very perceptive, I thought. But then there's other things that are going on. Um, uh, I would, you know, I will fully expect that the U.S. ruling elite is going to try and, I think you, you hinted at it in the beginning, but they're going to try and lop off sectors. But I leave other people, you know, to write on this who are more knowledgeable than I, although I've been following a lot of, um, or trying to, I'm a little behind last week or two, there's a lot of debate over the census and Latinos and Hispanics, and I think that is very deep. I think people should pay attention to it. But I'm going to tell you one important statistic that I don't think has gotten enough attention, and that is from the 200 to the 2010 census, the number of, quote, Hispanics identifying as white went up, right, by 3%. And that, I think, is these pressures in this country. I don't mean to go off on that. I, as I say, I look to people who work in those areas and know what we're dealing with a little more. But there's got to be that pressure, right? Um, similarly, we want to look at um, intermarriage patterns and things and how they affect different groups differently. I mean, it's a, there's a lot, and groups are coming, you know, when you look at Asian population, there's factors you want to look at, Latino, and I'm looking for the people working in those areas, but at least a bit informed by this history, you know, and then, you know, help bring, bring to it. So I don't have all the answers, but what I do think, I do think 
this is what they know, this white supremacy. This is what they know. And this is what they've relied on every time. And let's not sow illusions, you know, and not realize that this is what they're coming at us with the next time again, you know. And this, is, this crisis is deepening. And they're going to find all kinds of ways to shape it in a white supremacist fashion. And even without using the words, right? You know, like they did with those laws. Domestic and agricultural work. Well, you know, however they do it, right? You know, you're a felon. A fel I'll, I, I, we could talk about, there's laws. People talk about their illegal aliens. But there are some people who come in with the presumption of legality, can be a felon in their homeland, can be a felon in their, no, in this country, can be a felon in their homeland and come and get all those public uh, programs that the youth on 125th Street who gets picked up for, for a, a joint or two is denied for the rest of their life. It's conscious ruling class government policy. And I can get specific on some of that. So, so, yeah. Uh, this woman has been trying to your article, where, you know, like, uh, it, it's, where and, you know, yeah. where do you, okay. do you like it, to type your name? Or yeah, yeah, my name is simply Jeffrey B. Perry, I, and Muriel made a little joke about the B, but I use that for Google, right, because <laughs> there's other people with my name, right, Jeffrey B. Perry, and if you go to that webpage, I don't know if we can get online here, anybody, but when you go to the first top web, web page, right in the top left, mm -hmm. the article with that name, Developing <coughs> Conjuncture, is there, you click it, it's a PDF. Okay. And then you can read it, you can put it on your handheld or whatever, or you can print it out. Yeah. As I say, it's long, but it, it, long? it 117 <laughs> pages. Oh, it, started as tw it started as 200, 2,500 words, and uh, there's a, but at the end I write a four page history, what happened. It's got to do with the academics and how they, how, how, uh, I'm working on volume two of Hubert Harrison. This is only volume one, I got 1,200 pages on this baby. Could you talk about what are the implications of this whole construct, this whole of, of white skin privilege? What are the implications for um, how we organize? Good, yeah. very good question. Good question. Good as question. a union leader, as people in this room who have organized around different areas, uh, let, let, me, let, me, let me pose something as somebody who goes back, yeah. me, with SDS and white skin privilege, and there was a, a certain approach that turned me off. Um, which was that what you do is you go to the white workers and tell them they have to repudiate their white skin privilege. Um, I never saw that work. <laughs> and, and thank you, Keith. And, and I, I almost thought you were throwing me up a softball because for the following reason, right under the article that I just mentioned to you about the developing conjunction, conjuncture, I have an article on how we fought the good fight in the Postal Service. And it details, this is workplace organizing, how we went in there and not just necessarily coming in, we're in there, we're working, right? And this is a big 4,000 worker facility right across the river in Jersey City, a mile in perimeter. Strikes, strike against the federal government, right? Night, Sean got fired, I got fired. Some people got their jobs back. This, and by the way, this strike, was two years, three years before PATCO. Everybody talks about um, uh, Reagan firing the PATCO. We, we had 200 fired postal workers under Jimmy Carter, the Democrat. So oh. just, just be clear on that one, too. Um, yeah, but Keith, in answer to your question, so in there, and some of the key points, some of the key points in that article is Hubert Harrison, the touchstone. Every issue we looked at that we dealt with how is white supremacy shaping it, and how are we going to deal with it? For instance, we had light duty denials of pregnant women. Postal service, you're supposed to, get, you're supposed to have workers. We, we're not eligible for layoffs, so they're supposed to find work for you. But they, there was a pattern where they were denying women light duty assignments, particularly black women, particularly in our craft, Male handlers, heaviest craft, had a disproportionate number. Black women workers denied. So we wage protests, we wage issues and struggles around that. Every issue, we get the discipline records. You're a white worker, you're a black worker, and the same offense, you're getting twice the, the discipline. We waged that. We came out with regular publications every, every week on Thursday, because every other week on Thursday was payday. So we knew we had the best attendance, right? <laughs> no, no, right. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and we do that. But then we came to other things, Keith, which gets closer to what you're talking about. And, 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 and I got to tell you, as we were doing this, and, and then we look at the makeup of our stewards apparatus and we set up committees and we made sure 
We had, uh, actually we had disproportionate numbers of black and Latin workers, women, you know, for our craft, right? And, and we're setting up all our committees. We're coming out, every issue, every theme, we're talking about the conditions, how bad they are, and the white supremacist shaping, because it all goes together, right? Um, but then you run into things like uh, details or overtime, you know, and there's rules in the contract for these things, but management finds ways to get around them, and a lot of times the workers will go along with it and, you know, just look the other way, and if you speak out, you get punished for speaking out on it. So, say we had a pay location and then it was going to be two hours work every night. Sh should be rotated, but they're not, and the same pets of the supervisor are getting it, you know, usually in a racist pattern, right? We would, we would hammer at that. We would hammer at light denuity denials. You come into the workplace and you're supposed to get your bid job based on seniority. But some people were getting what we call the tuckaways. They get Friday and Saturday night off, you know, uh, because they knew this one or that one. We go into our first labor management meeting and the entire apparatus of management in a 4,000 worker postal facility. They have 14 representatives there. Every one is Italian member of the Columbia Association. Mm -hmm. A lily white, uh, we never let them get off that. Uh, they, they could, nothing they could say, but what about the Columbia? They were, they were using franking privileges to mail from our address on County Road. And never, we, we would draw in so much heat on them from me. So there's ways to wage these struggles, to oppose white supremacy. And, and when we started challenging things, if say you're a white worker and you've got your little detail that you shouldn't have and stuff, we'd say, no, that's it. You, you, you finish out this month and that's it. You, know, you, got, you, they, you were told you had it for a month, we're doing a fair thing. People wanted to come to blows, you gotta, but you gotta show you're for real, right? And that's it, and when you do that, then you build a unity that people can respect. The people are looking, is this for real? You know, just go to back. And so, not that it was perfect or anything like that, but in answer to your question, because I knew people would ask that, well, how do you put this shit into practice, right? Yeah. So the article is right there. It offers some suggestions or ideas based on concrete workplace practice. Also, there's other things which I haven't had a chance to write up yet, the anti-apartheid work, the affirmative action, ten try and apply it. I think it can be applied to everything. Keep in mind, that's why I summed up, keep in mind Harrison's thing, the touchstone. Keep in mind Alan's thing. This is central to what we got to deal with if we want to make revolution, we got to deal with this white supremacy. Yeah. To me, the, the, uh, the heart of this is struggle. That it's through struggle yeah. that people work. Uh, we have that there's a, a, obviously just an educational piece to this, and tonight is an example of it. But the education that you were doing was in the context of struggle around people's interests as workers. Just to respond to that, I try and do both. I mean, I try and do the practical right. work, you know. But I think it's important that we, in every way we can, go after this white race thing. We got to make clear that at least the progressives are clear. This white race is a ruling class social control formation. It's created by them, maintained by them, and it serves their interests. Now, what that all means, I, I, in one sense, again, I'll go back to Harrison. That's why I had the thing. Harrison leads in the struggle to use Negro with a capital N, right? Sixties is the struggle black, black consciousness and stuff like this. I think there's other struggles over identity that have to be waged, right? And I think there's gotta be serious question of this white identity at all levels and, and undergo, you know, challenge it historically, challenge it in practice, things like that, that's my thoughts. You know, on one hand, we can think about like these kind of micro level activities that we can do to kind of push back. But there's also another piece that's there that is that as people are really becoming conscious of these types of things, the system is already adapting. And I think that what we see is that, you know, and Michelle Alexander points to this, a couple of other political theorists and sociologists that point to this like changing, you know, structure of white supremacy. And, um, you know, so my question is, is like, you know, yeah, that those, those kind of micro level, you know, things that we could do um, could aid in like kind of, you know, quick fixes. But um, what, what, how do we think about like the, the system that's continually changing and adapting? And um, like how do we, and well another one is that, uh, how does this type of white supremacist structure fit into like globalism? If we're thinking about um, um, America and its white structure, but it's tied to a, a <coughs> economic, economic struggle, right? Um, what is this going to look like um, as we're becoming more of a global um, 
just in terms of the lasting. And I'm, again, I grew up in the era, particularly Vietnam War was very big. I mean, that was a big one, but that was white supremacist to the core, and people knew about, you know, Muhammad Ali, right? I mean, he was clear, however he phrased, you know, and, um, and in Africa now, I mean, or the anti-Arab, you know, struggle. It's embedded in, in, in particularly the right wing's appeal, all this white supremacy. I mean, these are, these are, it doesn't even have to be said, you know, it, it, it's these red areas, right? You know? And um, so um, I think it's central to U.S. imperialism, white supremacy. Um, just an answer to that. And I think it has been, you know, for, you know, going back. Um, in many of these areas, again, other people I think can write and speak more knowledgeably than me. Um, if, uh, the, the other about the micro, I, I'm not sure if I well, understood so that. Like the, the, this, the system is, is continually, you know, <laughs> right. adapting and changing, and you know, it seems that we, you know, spend time trying to figure out like what's going on in the present, while the the structure is like a step ahead of like, right. you know, I, how are we. I, yeah, I think they do that, and I think we have to develop plans and strategies and things. What I tried to do here tonight, I'm not trying to come with all answers or anything like that. I'm trying to present Alan's thing, Little Harrison. I think they offer insights. I, I tried to elaborate and hammer them a few times. In this country, white supremacy has been central to how they maintain uh, control. The white skin privileges are crucial to that. They've created this white race to help in it. Every issue we look at, we have to look at how white supremacy is shaping it and what's then that's where we have to be creative. What's going to be our response? How are we going to deal this and answer the keys to it, right? Not, not a, there's not a, a formula or anything like that. You know, how are we going to deal with this, right? And um, I think that's what we got to do. And I actually think if we start doing that in good form, and particularly your generation, the younger people, right, as, you, as we do this, um, then the real leadership of our struggle is going to emerge, you know, as Keith would say, you know, people coming out of practice, but also with some good theoretical clarity on what's important, why it's important. Again, not that I have, you know. And practice. And, yeah, that's what I'm talking about, the practice, <laughs> right, yeah, no. I'm not uh, really quite sure about the history of this country, uh, about uh, the white privilege. Mm -hmm. um, the way that I see history on my part of the world, it was that uh, we fight the struggle against uh, imperialism and capitalism, capitalism uh, which um, maintains the main focus in fighting against those who have control over the power. And I never quite understood uh, the difference between uh, the bosses or in, for instance, in here, the white supremacy that you call, or in Africa, where you have the police attacking uh, their own people, right. Right? because their voices are, as, are sending them to attack their own people. Mm -hmm. So, is it, so I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure um, whether we really do with this. What is this situation with the white supremacy? Because what I can see is that even if the people who are in control, there's a division. So they're fighting for their own interests. And what they do is keep us divided. And then they pretend, like for instance, saying that you are, I'm a Latino, so I have an, an interest different than African American and white and, and many other groups. So, but then, if we identify ourselves as the workers, I think that's how we define our class, and not, yeah. and I don't think it's by the different um, situations that you were presented. So, would you uh, explain to me how did well, that start work? First off, I appreciate your comments very much, and I, I have some familiarity with what you're talking about. Alan, who we're talking about, doesn't write on Latin America too much because it's you know Spanish, you know, history different than the English, right? And he's trying to deal with this country. Um, what you describe, I understand. I've been you know to El Salvador. I, I have just a, you know at least a little familiarity, right? And um, and other places in Latin America too. So um, I understand what you're describing, and I think it, it, it's you know accurate what you're describing in terms of struggles that people wage elsewhere. In this country. 
Alan again was talking about why was this country so relatively different, particularly than the other advanced capitalist countries. In England, in France, in Germany, you've got social democratic parties, labor parties, at least things that give the pretense of being for working people, right? The U.S. never even gets close to that. It's very backward, and um, you probably, you, you're, 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 yeah, since you've been here, I'm sure you've seen how these red states function, which are really code words for white voting blocks, you know, and, and things like that. That's a ma in this country, that's a major obstacle. Now, in El Salvador, you have other issues. You know, I look to the, comrade, the comrades from there to decide, okay, what are the principal issues we have to deal with? What do we have to address? Imperialism, or, you know, native bourgeoisie, whatever, right? Um, and, and, and that's what you would take the lead in doing. I'm trying to share with people here in terms of the U.S. What is this, you know, because we've got certain unique situations here, right? What, what is the nature of that and how do we begin to deal with that? And it, as it, to the degree that we're successful, we make your struggle easier. And I know you know that, right? You know, if we can weaken imperialism and U.S. imperialism in Latin America, that you know aids your struggle and vice versa your struggle helps here one other thing i want to just point out though in terms of alan and you might find this very interesting on my web page that i mentioned the article on the census on the 2000 census actually goes into discussion of other latin american countries and i think you would find that in again he's not trying to lay out answers but he's done a lot of research and he poses some questions and looks to other people to take the lead. But he compares the situation in different countries, compares what happens when people come here, you know. So I would just suggest that also. But thank you very much for your comments. My only concern is with the identification of the buffer system as if it has some positive aspect to slavery. Uh, I just left the Caribbean on the 24th. I think they're more colonized than ever. To hear a woman come on the bus and tell me that she's making $50 a week and she's celebrating her independence, and but she's begging. Everywhere I went throughout Jamaica, I got to the point to where I, I didn't even want to get off my bus because they were begging. The buffer system that's being touted to have been, you know, a difference between the the slavery system, you know, in the United States. I, I don't see any difference. I see them as individuals who were looking out for their own best interests, and I don't see them as having any interest in the fight of the people that were below them. Just as in, you talk about. The European situation with the serfs that were on the land and they wanted to get rid of the serfs, I see them as being problematic as well. And I just, I, I can't, as much as I love you, Jeff, and you know that, continue to hear this situation about these buffers serving a worthwhile purpose and changing the situation with the people in that era when the era has changed now and that buffer has proved it not been subservient. Okay, Issa, maybe I've not made myself clear. I am not in the least arguing the buffer serves a positive interest. There's a buffer for racial oppression, which is Lily White, a buffer for national oppression, which takes a sector of the oppressed. Racial oppression is bad, national oppression is bad. I'm not arguing this is a good thing, right? right? Racial oppression is bad, national oppression. I agree with you. I have friends. I've not been to Jamaica. I've been to some other places. But I know from a little reading and talking to friends and stuff, conditions are so bad now as you describe. It's, you know, it's horrible. And people are forced to leave their countries, break up families. This is horrible. I agree. But I'm not, I'm not saying there's anything good about the buffer I social. Well, what I, what with this last point. Okay. Not oh, the right. merchant class in Jamaica right now is Indian. Yeah. And it's sad. I I have a picture that I took. Only picture I took 900 pictures in Jamaica. I only brought one home. I took a picture through the barbed wiring on the edge of the resort showing the beach, but I had indigenous Jamaicans on this side of the wire. And it, it, just, it just touched me so deeply that this was the situation that they found themselves in. 
when the buses stopped on the island, they stopped at Indian shops. The, the drivers were rewarded for bringing American tourists to Jamaican shops. They were given a little extras. But the people are suffering. And it's, it's a result of the history. And this history can no, no longer be promoted as, as being any different from the American situation because the enslavement is the same and the historical ramifications at this time are the same. It's just, well, I, I agree. People are suffering worldwide. I, in that developing conjuncture, I try and make that point. You know, th this crisis is deepening. It's getting worse for everybody. There are si different systems of social control, and if you're going to function in a country, you've got to understand how they're maintaining control if you want to wage successful <coughs> struggle. That's basically what I'm arguing. Right? My question pertains to the invention of the white race as a function of the appropriation of guns. Um, I mean, something that I took from from the, from the get-go was that gun ownership rights were stripped from certain people and put in the hands of other people. If you look at the Irish-American experience in New York, for example, a lot of Irish-Americans became police officers. I'm not making any value judgments on police officers, but there, there's a history of trigger-happy police officers. You go you look at Katrina, you look at what happened after the flood, there were trigger happy people there. And in general, it seems that the, the dialogue that's going on, especially in the wake of uh, Sandy Hook, uh, is that you know we as Americans, our fundamental right is, to, is, to, is for gun ownership. And when you hear people arguing this point, it seems like a certain nostalgia for a time when the Ku Klux Klan you know, the idea that you can own a gun is 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 a is a way that you can perpetuate racial oppression. So I would like you to comment on that. Well, just very briefly. Um, and I know there's been some more discussion within the past few weeks on Second Amendment and, and some of that history. But in general, I, I had a few references there to when they stripped the right to own guns mm -hmm. from African Americans. They stripped the right of self-defense. And they extended it. They, you finished your European American, and you finished five years. Here's your gun, right? That's what they were doing. That's the laws they're passing. And so there's been an aspect of that all along. And and I think certainly some of some of the most ardent defenders of the right to possess arms and stuff have been, um, you know, you know, people tied to this whole white supremacy thing. And and you know, it's, and it's particularly been in the context of white supremacy. However, I'm also aware, and this is where I've not followed all this, but when we grow up, I growing up in the 60s, and when the Black Panthers said, well, we should have the right to have guns yeah. too, yeah. there was a very different response, yeah. right? Um, they, yeah, they, they want to change the laws all of a sudden. So um, again, I, I'm just not so current. I mean, to the, the last few weeks, there's been a lot more discussion on this. Um, and I'm, you know, willing and eager to learn on all of this. I, it's not something I, I've been tied up doing this. <laughs> I'll be telling you the truth. Yeah. Ronald. The major contradiction I see is capitalism itself, because race is a tool used by, and you described it, used by the ruling elites. If I didn't make that well, clear, well, I, I uh, agree with that. I am, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, it's a tool used by them. Yeah that uh, necessitates and facilitates the uh, exploitation that has to come with capitalism. That has to be poor, absolutely. It, it just cannot survive without having poverty. You see, and I, I think we have to kind of push the understanding of capitalism and its nature and how insidious it, insidious it is to human nature. You see, I think that that's where the, the sharpest contradiction comes from, therefore, capital is private and labor is social. We see that, that, that kind of thing going on, and we have to understand what that means. And I think if we can, because I don't think we can get rid of the racial issue until we get rid of the capitalist system because that's the system that promotes profit. 
And as long as you have profit, you're going to suck the blood of poor people and keep them oppressed, white, black, whatever. Allen threw out, and if I didn't make this clear, I mean, this guy is so thoroughly anti-capitalist, and he does the economic, he does the economic analysis, what you're talking about, the political analysis. It reeks of anti-capitalism, anti-plantation bourgeoisie. I mean, that, that's, what, that's what all his work, his life, he used to talk to me about coming up out of the mines and seeing the foreman and, and that real class, you know, sentiment that he had. But you, when you argue that you have to deal with capitalism to deal with racism, Allen is arguing something different. He's saying this white supremacy is crucial to how capitalism maintains social control in this country. And if we want to undo capitalism, we've got to really take this issue on. That's the difference. I'm just in a bit of a quandary how all this is really going to work out because um, um, has it, does anyone know who Terry Brooks is? Terry Brooks is a novelist, all right? Yeah. And he's written, you know, he's written all these books. He's written the scripts to like Star Wars and everything. Yeah. Double works at a bookstore. Yeah. And so, <laughs> says, you know, millions of copies of books. I don't want to insult Alan or Hubert Harrison, but you know, and, and any academics here, but you know, it's like you all are not in the game. And all these books, you know, they're a racist. Right? Races of, of, they're just races. Everything is explained racially. Okay? Do you understand me? <laughs> you know? I mean, the biggest movies now is what? Tolkien, right? Races. This one from Wagner. Races. Everything's explained racially. Verstancy? Do you understand? <laughs> right? You just said with the Republican Party. <laughs> Right? We just, the, the, the Republican Party just came up there and said, we're the party of white males. No. Right? That's what the Republican Party just said. So it's the Democrats. <laughs> so what, 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 look, at the, look at the Democrats. I mean, they're not saying that. You know, they're, they're at least at that, that, that's, uh, certain level. So, why do you, so how can you account for all of those white men in the uh, Obama administration? Well, that, I mean, what, what, what? Look, look at look at the look at the votes. Look at the votes. I'm in a union, right? I'm in a union. Right? The unions, right, when they when they get I mean, which are tiny as was like ten percent now. It's like so 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 sixty percent, you know, when they get sixty percent of ten percent, they say, Well we're we're successful. The rest of the white boys, they do whatever. And you know, because what I'm what I'm really worried about is that you know you have with, with all this gun control thing. What really has happened is like all these white people went and bought guns. I'm really worried about apartheid. That's what I'm worried about. Because remember, 1920 in Germany they had a socialist president. 13 years later they had Hitler. That's what. So that's what I'm worried about. I just don't see. See the the, the thing. My problem with all of this is like. I don't see how you get from point A to point B to point C with this racial stuff, because I don't see white people giving this up. Well, yeah, for most white people, this has uh, no, worked out, I, really, this I, I, worked I, out yeah. really well for them. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. we, can, we can be here in New York, right, and play these games. But if you talk to most black people, if I go to black people, I says, you know, if I go to black people, I say, well, where would this white boy be if he were black, right? Where would this white boy who's owned this business, where's this white boy who's, who's working with, where would they be if they're black? I mean, what would we say? I mean, most of us say, well, they'd be in jail. We see what they do. They do drugs. They do drugs worse than the, worse than the I live in Harlem, man. They do drugs more than, than we do in Harlem. They'd be under the jail. All right? So I just, I just want to see, you know, okay. someone needs to explain to me how we get to point A to point B. And with the gun control thing, all these white boys buying, Buying guns and the white left is saying, "Oh, control guns, control guns, control guns." I'm, I'm, I'm back. I'm getting more back and back to the '60s. I said, "No, no, 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 no. Uh, let's, 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 let's get the guns because the church, you know, the U.S. government has insane weaponry. You no, talk about they're fascism. They're talking about controlling assault uh, weapons, uh, wait, not uh, giving up your guns. Yeah. Okay. Okay, come on, get with it. No, well, well, okay. yeah, well, <laughs> no, 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 the debate, the debate, the direct, what, what started this? No, well, A white 
boy <laughs> killing his mother and these students <laughs> in the <laughs> suburbs, <laughs> which is like paradise, I know. right? I know. Nothing that I tried to say today, I hope, gave the impression in every area of this society, I threw up the statistics at the end, black people are faring horribly far worse than European Americans. There's nothing saying anything but that. Uh, I'm also arguing that European American laboring people are not faring well, so well, as you maybe yeah. just indicated, right? Um, I'm also, although we didn't get into this, I understand your assessment of how some of these European Americans, these white people are locked into that white race thing, and that's gonna be a tough nut to crack. I understand that. I think what we've got to start trying to do is wage the struggle. You've got to start trying to break some people off. You've got to win people. We've got to learn the more accurate history, and we've got to wage practical struggle like Keith was talking about. So what choice do we have? We're up against it. This is what we've got to do. Uh, when you talk about the first slaves that were taken out of Africa by the Portuguese, or when you talk about Bartolome La Casas and him going to the Pope, I, I guess what we were saying, was that the invention of whiteness? Was that about whiteness there? Or is there a continuation or is there a gap between that and what happened in Virginia? Yeah, I, I think what Alan's saying is that there's a qualitative difference, right? Um, Portuguese are taking Africans. Europeans had gone into different areas of Europe. The uh, English are shipping Irish slaves. I mean, you know, things are going on in these 1400s, 1500s, 1600s. And certainly Africans are bearing the brunt of that from certain sectors also. But what Alan argues, he's, he basically says in the Caribbean, Jamaica, Barbados, in the Anglo-Caribbean, you have slavery. We recognize that, right? That's what you're talking about. But in the US, he calls it racial slavery because the key to maintaining social control is this white race thing. Which he, which he says is what we've got to come and deal with. So he says how they maintain control is different. Not that there's not a ruling elite that's white in both places, but after that, who's taking part in the social control? Yeah. I don't know what I'm doing. Thank you. What? Well, Issa, I'm here. We can call. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. My question is the only thing Yes, yes.